There are several different viewpoints on Daniel 11 floating around the church right now, and in a way that's exciting. The reason it's exciting is that people are actually studying it. And they're being driven by the Spirit to understand it more. I know within my own ministry, in the next three weeks, there are three very important meetings uh, with people studying Daniel 11. One of them, for several days, will be getting together a group of student, Bible students, uh, union people, conference people, lay people. Uh, and for three days, we're going to hit three different views on Daniel 11, and I get to present on one of them. I ask for the third position, because I'm going to agree with the first half of the first presentation, the second half of the second presentation, and I figure once they get done discussing that, I can just say I agree with that part and that part. And uh, it'll be a lot easier that way. But it's exciting. It really is. And Daniel 11, I believe, will ultimately be a large part of the foundation of a loud cry. It's the part of the prophecy that applies especially to the time of the end. And I think we're living in that time. As I was studying the role of Islam and Christianity and prophecy, I had Revelation 13 in my mind. I had a fairly clear understanding of Revelation 13 and nothing could be outside of that as I looked for something. And then one day I got an email from Samuel Bakayoki. And I did not agree with that email. And because of it, it opened up a whole new door of understanding. He started talking about Islam and Christianity were going to be uniting and become one. And I thought, oh, Samuel, they're like north and south. They're polar. Uh, 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 Daniel 11. North and south. And I went and I looked into there, and then I started studying what Martin Luther said. And in a matter of a few seconds, though, when I opened Daniel 11 with that thought in my mind, all of a sudden, all the questions I had began to have answers. Daniel 11, in a matter of a few seconds' time, after years of study, a few seconds' time, it suddenly came together. And so we're going to be sharing with you uh, some of what we've learned. And I developed a seminar on it. God pushed me into that. And then I was impressed to write a book on it. And I said, okay, Lord. And I started trying. And I tried for three years and never got anywhere because I hate writing with a passion. I'll talk to anybody. Just don't make me write it down. And finally, I met a guy that I'd known years before, Tim Lale. And I said, what you up to? And he says, well, I'm kind of free rent lance writing right now and I don't have a lot to do. And I said, huh, <laughs> good. We got together and a couple of months later, we had a manuscript ready rough draft manuscript. I'd promised to turn it into the review in the Pacific Press, uh, and I was pretty positive neither of them would bite for something as controversial as picking up Daniel 11 and Islam and Christianity. But I'd promised both get presses to release it to them, so I released it to both at the same time and said, I figure neither of you are going to accept it, so I gave it to both of you at once. Let's get the rejections over with. The review accepted it. Uh, that was back in April of this year. That was rough draft. End of April, they accepted it, and it takes them two years to get from a finished manuscript, manuscript to book in hand. And I said, you know, guys, if you do that, it's not going to be prophecy, it'll be history. And they got it in gear, and the president said we'd have it by ASI in August. And the editorial staff said there is no way. Thankfully, the president won. So instead of taking two years, we went from rough draft at the end of April to book in hand in August. And uh, it was really exciting to see what God would do. And let's get right into Daniel 11 and give you an idea of what we're going to be looking at. Number one, I want to tell you when I talk about Daniel, oh, let me tell you this too. I am really excited to be here for another reason. So many times when I don't get a chance to talk to a church before I show up for a 10-day public seminar on Daniel 11, about halfway through the seminar, we get this comment. My wife and I both get them. If we'd have known what you were going to say, we would have invited somebody. Do you know what that's like to hear halfway or three-quarters of the way through a series? <laughs> so you get a chance to have a feel for it, only what we're going to cover in three hours, we're going to cover in 10 then and fill out a whole lot more information. 
Because if you don't already understand a historicist's viewpoint of prophecy, this is going to be a challenge for you. Daniel 11, to me, begins in verse 2, goes all the way through 12.3. That's the prophecy that is given to Daniel. It is chronological and it confirms what Adventists have always taught. And that's important. This isn't something that is brand new that goes a totally different direction. It confirms what's always been taught, but it adds the piece of the role of Islam and Christianity in their struggle. It's a repeat and enlarge of Daniel 2, 7, 8. Daniel chapter 2, you know the image? is repeated in 7 with more detail. 8 comes along and adds some other details to it. Wouldn't it be a surprise if Daniel 11 didn't do the same thing? Daniel 11 should follow the same pattern, especially since it starts in the time of Persia and then goes to Greece just like the other prophecies. It follows the same patterns. And so we are going to use Daniel 2, 7, and 8 as a repeat and enlarge pattern. In Daniel 11, though, the conflict or the discussion comes in, who's the king of the north and who's the king of the south? By the way, we're going to give you a study guide this afternoon. I guess that's the pastor's way of making sure you come back. But we're going to give you a study guide that covers the whole of Daniel 11. But to understand the king of the north and the king of the south, you need to understand Jeremiah chapter 1. You see, Jeremiah was the prophet of Daniel. When Daniel was a kid, Jeremiah was the prophet. And Jeremiah said, don't fight the Babylonians, and you're going to be in captivity for 70 years. So Daniel doesn't fight the Babylonians. He ends up becoming prime minister. Hey, you know, it actually works when you pay attention to the prophets. And he paid close attention to the prophets. And when he becomes an old man, he knows it's time for them to be set free because Jeremiah said 70 years. So do you think Daniel had an idea of what Jeremiah said? Yeah. Take a look now when he talks about the north. For behold, I am calling all the families of the kingdoms of the north, says the Lord. They shall come and each one set his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem. Question. As you go through Dan, Jeremiah, you discover that the king of the north in this instance is Babylon. But was that singular or plural when it talked about kingdom or kingdoms? It's plural. So it is not completely fulfilled with Babylon's attack from the north. Interesting. Here's my simple suggestion. Remember Daniel 2? 7 and 8 are repeat and enlarge pattern. Daniel 11 is a repeat and enlarge. And what I discovered is every one of these powers, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, divided Rome, or the Little Horn time period, are all invading from the north when they have made Jerusalem. They are the kingdoms of the north. So Jeremiah 1 has Babylon as the first, and then the rest are in series to make it plural. Let's see if that actually fits. Daniel 2, 7, begin with Babylon. And which direction does Babylon come from? Well, they were way east, but they didn't cross the desert. They came up the river valleys and dropped down from the north. So if you were a guard on the gates or on the walls of Jerusalem, you'd go, hey, there's an enemy coming from the north. And that's exactly what Babylon did. Next comes Persian rule, and we find it in Daniel 11, verse 2. And now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia. We're going to stop here for a moment. In Daniel 11, what do you think Persia represents? Anybody? Can somebody tell me? It's not, Persia's not Babylon. King of the south? Well, they're going to attack from the north. I have a really simple thought. Catch this one. Persia represents Persia. Why do I stop to point that out? Because almost nobody will say Persia. We are so used to looking for the symbols in prophecy that when we get a literal prophecy, we're stumped by it. Don't overthink Daniel 11. It gets real simple if you don't. Daniel 11 is literal. Persia represents Persia. Let's keep going. And the fourth shall be far richer than them all. Now notice he also goes one, two, three. Now the fourth king. Isn't that chronological? It's also very literal. One, two, three, four. Chronological and literal. Daniel 11. It goes all the way through that way. And the fourth 
will be far richer than them all, and by his strength through his riches he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. Now let me ask you a question. Who do you think Greece represents? Great, you got the easy lesson. That one's done. Medo-Persia, come in though. They are the second power from the north, from the time of Jeremiah. Which direction do they attack from? They follow the same attack route as Babylon did and come down from the north. And notice we have Jeremiah 50 verse 9 and look what Jeremiah says about the Medes and the Persians. For behold, I will raise and cause to come up against Babylon an assembly of great nations from the north country. Jeremiah wants to make it clear the Medes and the Persians are the second power from the north. And there's a combination of two that take down Babylon, the Medes and the Persians. There's not a bunch of coincidence in here, folks. This is very specific. And Medes and the Persians are the second northern power. Babylon the first, Medes and the Persians the second. And it says he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. Now if you notice here, we have a note, there is a key to understand Daniel 11. Whenever the current power, the current king of the north, attacks the rising power and fails to win, the focus changes. In this case, the fourth king, Artaxerxes the Great of Persia, he goes over and he attacks uh, the Greeks. He fails to win. And even though there are 12 more Persian kings in the Persian kingdom after him, Daniel 11 just totally dismisses all 12 of the following kings. And it, even though Alexander the Great has not arisen yet in Greece, Daniel 11 picks up Alexander the Great next. So as soon as you have the current power attack the rising power and fail to defeat the rising power, the focus of Daniel 11 switches to the new power. It doesn't care about has-been powers. It only lo is looking at powerful and rising powers. That will be that way all the way through the coming of Christ in Daniel 11. Very important. Every one of the transitions of power follow the same pattern. When it gets to Greece, verses 2 through 4, then a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. This is Alexander the Great. And when he is arisen, his kingdom shall be broken up and divided towards the four winds of heaven, but not among his posterity nor according to his dominion with which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be uprooted even for others besides these. Now, we have repeatedly four divisions of Greece. The leopard had four heads and seven. In eight, uh, the goat's horn is broken off and it's replaced with four smaller horns. In 11, Alexander the Great shows up. He's the first king. And when he goes down, it's to the four winds. There's a four-way division of Greece. And all these, it's an expand, a repeat and enlarge type idea. Which direction does Greece come in? It swings around on the land invasion route from the, from the north. How about that? We're three, three for three so far. Kingdoms of the north. But up until now, they're not called the kingdoms of the north, specifically in Daniel 11, because there has not been a king of the south. But now there will arise a king of the south, so the king of the north must be specifically mentioned as the northern power, and there will be a southern power. Whenever Greece or Rome divide, you have a king of the north and a king of the south. And in, Dan in Daniel 11, verses 5 through 19, the divided Greek empire, remember how many directions it split, folks? Four. How many does Daniel 11 care about? Only two. To the north and south of Jerusalem. When we hit the division of Rome, Rome divides how many ways? Ten. But how many will Daniel 11 care about? Only two, north and south. So in verses 5 through 19, we have the Greek Seleucids to the north and the Ptolemies to the south. The Seleucids were up in here, and they pushed south, trying to take over the Greek empire down in Egypt called the Ptolemies, and the Ptolemies were pushing north. Guess who got caught in the middle for several centuries? Jerusalem. How would you like to have your neighbors 
in a battle and they just decided your backyard was going to be the battleground. And they literally shoot at each other and you have guests in your backyard and they get killed. How would you like that kind of situation for year after year after year? That's what happened to Jerusalem. But folks, from this point on, God's, in the prophecy of Daniel 11, God's people are caught in the middle. And friend, you and I are still in the middle. If you're part of God's people, you are still in the middle and will be until the time Jesus returns. Oh, my handout this afternoon will have a whole bunch of history in verses 5 through 19. But I was hoping you'd come back this afternoon, and if I covered all the history, most of you wouldn't come back. How many of you loved history as your favorite class in high school? Oh, wow, maybe more of it would have come than I thought. This is pretty good. I'm still going to cut, cut that off. You can come back, get the study guide, and read all the detailed history. Uh, it's there. The detail is there, folks. And it's in the book as well. I just don't have time to cover it and keep you guys interested. But we're going to go to 17 to 19, which is Antiochus III and his daughter Cleopatra. This is Cleopatra I, not seven. Mark Anthony, Cleopatra, that's Cleopatra seven. But Antiochus the Great, or Antiochus III, he decides he's got a plan to take over the Ptolemies to the south. He's going to send his daughter down there to marry the king of the north, the south, the prince of the south. He will become king. She will become queen. She'll do something to get him knocked off. And then he will combine forces with his daughter and they will rule the western or eastern Mediterranean. Good plan. It works almost. But the prophecy said she would not stand with him. And so once she took control of the Ptolemy kingdom down in Egypt, he said, okay, honey, let's join up. And she said, uh, only if you want to serve me. She'd become just like him. She wanted to be the ruler of the world. And uh, that didn't work. So he turns towards the west because there's a new power rising over that way. It's called Rome. And he heads towards the western coastlands, the Bible says. And there will be a commander that meets him and a general, Roman general comes out, meets Antiochus the Great, defeats him. Antiochus has to turn around to go back home and raise money to pay off uh, the penalty for losing. And he raids a pagan temple on his return home and is killed while raising, raiding the temple. And it said he would die on his return home. Hey, prophecy fit. Now what would we expect? The focus will change to Rome. And it does, but I want to point something else. And again, these are, the, these are the keys of understanding Daniel 11. This is kind of the boring part. We get into the really exciting part when we hit the time of the end of the time we live in right now. But it makes no sense if you don't understand where we've come from. I want you to notice something. You had Greece as a kingdom of the north. Eventually it goes to the new northern kingdom, Rome. But in between you had a divided north, divided Greece with a north versus south. This was always the Ptolemy of Seleucids up here, always the Ptolemies down here. For centuries, once they began their conflict, it didn't end until the next power unifies the whole area. Daniel 11 gives us these clues. The same pattern will be in effect when Rome splits. Once you identify north versus south, it will stay that way until the next king unifies the whole area. Friends, once Rome divides, what's the next kingdom? After the feet of iron and clay, what's the next kingdom? Christ's coming. So that divided situation, once you identify who the north and the south is in Rome, you have that identity that will hold true all the way to the coming of Christ, if it follows the pattern. And I can find no evidence or reason to suggest that it would not, historically or prophetically. Daniel 11, verses 20 to 22, is the Roman phase. And in it, the Prince of the Covenant shows up. That would be Jesus. And does Jesus not show up during the Roman phase? Definitely does. And so next we have Rome, the legs of iron, this iron uh, teeth, beast with iron teeth and iron claws and ten horns. Rome comes in from the north. We're now four for four, invading from the north. 
It would be a power that would tax the glorious kingdom. Notice what it says. There shall arise in his place when he imposes taxes on the glorious kingdom, but within a few days he shall be destroyed, but not in anger or in battle. Well, we have some New Testament confirmation on this one. But let me just ask you this question. What's the first Caesar who does not die in anger or in battle? Augustus. Julius dies on the steps of the Senate by an assassination. He gets riddled with knife holes. That would be in anger, at least to my way of thinking. If I was Julius Caesar, I'd think somebody was mad at me. And uh, so we have Augustus Caesar being the next one up, and he does not die in anger or in battle. And notice what he does do in the New Testament, Luke 2, 1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from who? Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. What was the reason for being registered? King James simply said taxed. It was a part of their taxation system. Rome was taxing Israel. Why did the Israelites hate the publicans? They were collecting taxes for Rome. That's what it was all about. Continuing, and in his place shall arise a vile person whom they will not give honor of royalty, but he shall come in peaceably and sing, seize the kingdom by intrigue. Tiberius Caesar comes in next without fighting a civil war. He comes in by intrigue, and he's never a well-liked Caesar. He's never thought as an upper-class Caesar, so he fits. And continuing, and with the force of a flood, they shall be swept away from before him and be broken, and also the prince of the covenant. And who is the Caesar when Jesus is crucified? Tiberius. It fits. Wow. All the way through, I look for these anchor points. The points such as Alexander the Great, Jesus. They have to be matching, folks. We have certain points that it has to hit on, or you know you're not on track. And this one is hitting. It's passing the test. What about this Prince of the Covenant? Now, one of the neat things about Daniel 11 is it's a chronological presentation of events all the way from Daniel's time to the coming of Jesus Christ. But they're kind of short and cryptic, just like this one. And you have the Prince of the Covenant broken. Well, Daniel 9 explains more of it. In Daniel 9, I'm not going to really have a chance to go into it, but you, most of you, I think, understand the 70-week prophecy decreed the, from the rebuilding of Jerusalem all the way to Messiah the Prince, and the, he's also the Prince of the Covenant who confirms the covenant for one week. He dies in the midst of the week, bringing an end of sacrifices. It brings in righteousness. It does away with sin. Who other than Jesus gets rid of sin and, does away and brings in righteousness? It's got to be Jesus. It's got to be. So, we have Rome attacking Christ, and who wins, folks? Does Jesus win or does Rome win? On the cross, Rome wins. And then, a hundred soldiers are given a really easy weekend duty. Keep a dead man dead. How many soldiers have been given that job? We got this guy, we want you to keep him dead for three days. Can you just picture the jokes? Who stabs him if he sits up? I mean, we got to keep a dead man dead. Did you hear the orders right? Yeah, that's what they said. Okay, let's go keep a dead man dead. Before three days are over, Violet, he's alive. We couldn't keep him dead. Who won? Jesus ultimately won that fight, didn't he? Okay, Rome attacks Jesus. I mean, Jesus didn't attack them. They killed him. But Jesus wins. So the focus will now change. And in verses 23 and following, it says, after the league is made. Question, after a league? Did Jesus make an agreement with those who wanted to follow him? Yeah. After an agreement is made. But it says they become deceitful and try to go for military power. Did the church stay true to Jesus or did they become deceitful and go the military power? Yeah, they began to use a might versus right idea. And so you have the rise of the papal Holy Roman Empire with a small number. They did not have large armies of their own. But they took over the kingdom, the former Roman Empire, 
peaceably, but with deceit. One of the clearest items to prove it is a found, basic foundational document of the Roman Catholic Church is the donation of Constantine. According to them, when Constantine left Rome, he gave them authority to rule from Rome in the donation of Constantine. Major problem. The donation of Constantine was proven centuries ago to be a forgery. They based their right to rule on deceit from the beginning. How about that? The Bible doesn't miss it. It's right there. Which direction does the Holy Roman Empire or the Little Horn attack Jerusalem from? During the Crusades, they did attack Jerusalem. They attacked from the north. They came in making them the final king of the north. From this time on, the king of the north is both political, geopolitical, and spiritual, as are Israel and the king of the south. That is another key component to understand. A lot of our scholars today will want to tell you that we are only dealing with spiritual applications after the coming of Christ. But in their own books, they talk about the role of the Ottomans and the Arab Islam during the Crusades, during the Ottoman Empire. If the prophecy are only spiritual, then it should have no geopolitical application. I argue a different point. It is both. And I argue it from the context. In Daniel 7, the king, the little horn, both attacks people and attacks God. Daniel 11, it leads real armies into real war, the king of the north, but it also attacks the covenant of God in his sanctuary. So if you're leading real armies in real war, that is geopolitical, it's literal. If you're attacking God, that is also spiritual. And so I've come to this, to me, very simple understanding. Daniel 11 started out with Persia being Persia, and it goes on through very literally, but it adds the spiritual dimension. So rather than taking away the literal, I just do what it does in the context and add the spiritual. And you know what happens when we do that? All of a sudden, the literal geopolitical application becomes a model of the universal worldwide struggle spiritually. Whatever happens to literal Jerusalem happens to God's people everywhere in the world. And it has worked historically and in the prophecy. What we now have in verses 25 to 28, and I know I'm going fast, but that's so I can get to verse 40 by the time we get to this afternoon. Unless you want me to take about 12 hours, and I could do Okay, we'll keep going. Uh, Daniel 25, 11, 25 to 28, we have the Crusades. Rome divides north and south. Let's take a look at it. Rome divides, if you were to take pagan Rome and just draw a line right through the middle of it. Do you notice how simple that is? And basically that line right through the middle, Christian north under the papacy, Holy Roman Empire, Islam to the south. At the break of the Roman Empire, did it break north and south? Yes. We're not used to thinking of it that way. But friends, look at a map and ask yourself the obvious. Is there a north-south break between two powers? Yes, it is. It's really not that hard. And you take this north-south conflict from the breakup of the Roman Empire, does it last all the way through today? Yes, this conflict does. By the way, there's a guy by the name of Boris Johnson. You can get on your YouTube and search out his name. He's the mayor of London, but he did a documentary for the BBC uh, talking about the breakup of the Roman Empire. And in it, he talks about the northern power being Christianity and the southern part power being Islam and how it's continued from the breakup all the way till today. And he's not talking about Daniel 11. He's just looking at history. And uh, so I would suggest you take a look at that if you want further information on it. But we have a conflict with Jerusalem caught in the middle for now 14 centuries. What other country or what other city have both Islam and Christianity wanted? Just like the Greek split 
Jerusalem is in the middle. Now in the Roman split, the city that's stuck in the middle more than any other city on earth is Jerusalem. So remember, once you identify the split, this time Rome, it's the ruling kingdom that splits, it divides north, which is papal-led Christianity, south, which is Islam, it will stay in conflict all the way until the new kingdom of the north arrives, which is the rock, Jesus Christ. And according to Isaiah, his throne is on the sides of the north. Now, here's something interesting. Pagan Rome switches over the papal Rome. This is the king of the north, folks. It's also called Babylon in Revelation. Babylon was the first king of the north. Revelation takes and uses the term Babylon, which matches the usage of king of the north in Daniel 11. It is allied in verses chapter 13 and 17 with the United States and Europe. By the way, that would be roughly NATO, behind the papacy. And it changes times and laws, and it changes from Sabbath to Sunday. We have the land of Israel or Palestine, and all who accept Jesus are heirs of Abraham and God's true Israel. The land is still there, but God's people are no longer the people of literal Israel. They're the people of faith, anyone who accepts Jesus Christ. By the way, at the end of the thousand years, where will God put his people of faith? He'll bring the new Jerusalem down to Mount of Olives, which is at the gates of old Jerusalem right where God said the king, kings of the north would set up their thrones. And that's where he sets up his throne. He's the final king of the north. And he brings his people, everyone of faith, back to that spot. Interesting. From the time of Jesus until he returns at the end of the millennium, the land of Palestine is a model of what's happening to the people, but eventually God and the people will be there too, but only at the end of the millennium. So don't be thinking you've got to be back in old Jerusalem now. Let Jesus take care of where you are and he'll get you there eventually. It'll be at least a thousand years from now, but he'll get you there eventually. But those people have the faith of Jesus and keep his commandments, including the... Yeah, what's the Sabbath of Israel? The seventh day, isn't it? Okay, God's spiritual Israel had the same Sabbath as his literal Israel. Interesting how this works. Now let's take a look at the south. It goes from Egypt, geopolitical Egypt, to Islam, which is both geopolitical and spiritual. That was geopolitical, that's spiritual, that's geopolitical, that's spiritual, that's geopolitical, that's spiritual. Notice the consistency of the pattern all the way through. That's important too. But they changed the day of worship from Sabbath to Friday. Where are God's people caught? you're still caught in the middle. Now, if you doubt that, go into a Roman Catholic-controlled country and have an evangelistic series. And see if the king of the north won't get mad at you. Or if you doubt it, go to a Muslim-controlled area and have an evangelistic series talking about Jesus as Lord and Savior. And see if the king of the south won't get mad at you. And you look at the history and ask, which one has hated God's people the worst? <laughs> That's a toss-up. During the Reformation, if I believed in reading the Bible in my common language, what would the king of the north do to me? He'd kill me. Burned at the stake, which is exactly what it says it will do in Daniel 11. Burn people in the flames. King of the south. I go distribute Bibles and... Arabic in uh, Saudi Arabia. What's going to happen to me? I'm going to get stoned. It's not going to do well. You see, friends, people ask me, Does the God of is, is the God of Islam the same as the God of the Christians? And, you know, they want me to say no. But the obvious answer is, unfortunately, the answer is yes. The God of the King of the North is a God of force. Do it our way or else. The God of the King of the South. Do it our way or else. Our way or you die. Which, doesn't that sound like the same God? God of force and hatred. 
It's not the true God. Most Christians are not following the true God. Most Muslims are not following the true God. What's the difference? Not much. There are a minority of Christians who are looking for a God of truth and of love and of forgiveness. You actually find him in here. There are a minority of Muslims who are looking for that kind of God as well. So a majority have the same God and a minority are looking for a same God of love and truth and forgiveness. Isn't that interesting? And by the way, the minorities are persecuted by the majorities in both the North and the South. It's consistent. You take a look at a map of today's world. Here's the Muslim majority, majority controlled nations. Are they predominantly north or south of Jerusalem? South. Here's formerly Christian Europe allied with the United States. Is it predominantly north or south of Jerusalem? North. It started a north-south struggle. It still is a north-south struggle. Then in verses 30 to 39, we find the autumn invasion and the time of the Reformation. There are three conflicts between the north and the south in Daniel 11. The time of the Arab phase and the Crusades was one. Next comes the Ottoman phase during the time of the Reformation. It's the second conflict. And during this conflict, they push all the way up, take Constantinople and move all the way up into Europe. And because of their invasion, it saves the Reformation. Otherwise, Martin Luther would have been wiped out by the Holy Roman Empire. I like to do this really quickly. Somebody forgot a time change. It's after one o'clock. <laughs> I just looked at a clock on the wall and thought, oh man, am I bad. <laughs> You've been in an evangelistic series where they talk about the papacy identified, right? And you look at Daniel 7 and it says it speaks great words or talks about blasphemy. Antichrist or great words can be either in place of Christ or against Christ. All right, what do we have here? The papacy puts themselves in place of Christ. Islam, to the south, denies the divinity of Christ and is thus against him. Both of them persecute the saints. We've already talked about that one. Uh, Rome receives the dragon seat, the capital of the Roman Empire. But so does Islam. Constantinople or Istanbul was the eastern capital of the Roman Empire. Rome goes to the Holy Roman Empire, Constantinople, Istanbul to the Islamic Empire. Both the north and south get one of the two capitals. They both have time prophecies, 1260 days or years for the papal supremacy from 538 to 1798. And from 1100 through the 1930s, it was clearly taught by the reformers and others that the first and second woe were related to the two phases of Islam. The first phase, Arab Islam. The second one, Turkish Islam. By the way, uh, William Miller combined that five months with Turkish Islam, except the reformers all leaned this direction. And it has a little better historical data behind it. But I found it interesting to realize one day how many woes were there in Revelation? Three. First woe, second woe, our pioneers taught were Ottoman and, well, forms of Islam. If one and two were Islamic conflicts with Christianity, it would make sense that possibly the third one would be as well. That being whatever it might be, in Revel Daniel 11, notice verse 29, and at the appointed time he, the king of the north, shall return and go towards the south, but it shall not be like the former or the latter. How many conflicts would there be between the north and the south? Three. Here's the first one. That's the Crusades, during which time they conquered Jerusalem. The second one is Ottoman, during which time they never came close to holding Jerusalem. And the third one, the time at the end, when they would once again control Jerusalem. Hmm. Historically, that's right on two out of three. Patrick Buchanan said this earlier in the year. As for a climatic conflict between a once Christian West and an Islamic world that is growing in numbers and advancing inexorably into Europe for the third time in 14 centuries, 
On this one, Brivik may be right. What I want you to notice here is what number of times have we gotten in the conflict? We are entering the third conflict, according to Patrick Buchanan. He doesn't know the good news. The good news is that it's the third and final conflict. There are only three in Daniel 11. It's going to be an intensely severe conflict, more intense than the first two. We haven't gotten into it yet. We're just entering it. But it is the final conflict between those two powers. The Bible tells us the king of the north would come back with great power, you know, and the beast would be wounded and come back with great power and all the world would follow after the beast. But friends, let's take a look at something. Here's the power chart of the papacy. It grows in power from 538 and then loses power in 1798. 1929, the concordate with Mussolini is signed and it starts growing in power and will lose power dramatically in the end of the seven plagues. Well, what happens if you put Islam's power curve on the same piece of paper? Look at that. Aren't they amazingly similar? North and south. Oh, let me ask it this way. The North Pole and the South Pole are not identical, are they? They're opposites. One's the North Pole, one's the South Pole. But what's the common color? White. What's the common temperature? They're opposites, but they're similar. The papacy and Islam are opposites, but very similar. All right? And so here you have the first conflict, Arab Islam, and it declines into the Crusades. Then the Ottomans come in, and they rebuild Islam, and then they crash in 1840. And by the way, there's recent evidence that Josiah Lynch may not have been wrong after all. And 1948... The Islam resurges because Israel is declared a state and instead of fighting each other, they now have a common enemy and they fight Israel. They combine forces. Then they get oil money and then they discover the use of terrorism for their causes. And as anybody knows, they have become a power to contend with in today's world. And we're going to stop it right there. I have been hurrying and hurrying. And where do we come next? I've gotten you up through two conflicts. Now in our second, con our second part, which we'll pick up at 4 o'clock this afternoon, we're going to start it at the time of the end, which is the third and final conflict. I want to tell you a couple of things about that. I'm going to show you the good news that God has a remnant within Christianity and within Islam. Daniel 11 doesn't talk that much about the ref, uh, ref, uh, remnant from within Christianity. That comes out of Revelation. Daniel 11 points out a remnant within Islam that stand true that you, for Jesus Christ at the time of the end. I think that's awesome. And friends, in today's world, you have Muslims that are receiving dreams and visions leading them to Jesus Christ. I talked with one this last week, a man I'd never met before, and he showed up at one of my meetings. He'd become a Christian. He's a Persian and just recently become a Christian. And he told me that his name's Muhammad, so I made the quick assumption I had a Muslim there. And uh, so I said, are, you know, are you Muslim? He says, I used to be. <laughs> and I said, sir, did you have a dream or a vision? He looks at me kind of funny. Yeah. <laughs> like, how did you know? And I said, well, from my experience, half, at least half the Muslims that become Christians have had dreams or visions leading them to Jesus Christ. Joel 2 says in the last days, young men and young women and old men will be having dreams and visions. Can you find in Joel 2 where it said it would only be Christians who got the visions? Do you know what it's telling me? We are into this third and final conflict. We are getting close to the time of the end. Jesus is tired of waiting on you and me. He's going direct through the Holy Spirit, direct into areas where the gospel hasn't reached and he's sharing the gospel. Friends, it's time we got serious in sharing the gospel.
And the neat thing about Daniel 11, when you finish understanding what we're sharing, you have a brand new tool to share with the world around you on how to lead them to Jesus Christ and to His Word, the Bible.